Okay. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Michalis Kamburelis and welcome to the presentation about Castle Game Engine. So, uh, we'll jump very soon into actual live demos of the engine, but before this, like a quick words of introduction. So the engine is fully open source, as you would expect. Uh, we support 3D and 2D games alike. We really support both those kinds of games, and I will actually show you the demos of both those kinds of games along with the presentation. Uh, we support many asset formats. This has been like one of my goals when developing the engine to support uh, many asset formats to like make it available. Whatever tool you use to create your assets, you will be able to create assets using uh, for our engine. So in particular, we have excellent GLTF support, and we use XVD nodes to express pretty much everything that you see on the screen. We also support Spine JSON, um, like Collada, Wavefront OBJ, and actually many other formats. So we really try to be versatile when it comes to that. Uh, we support many platforms, in particular desktops, which means Windows, Linux, Mac OS, FreeBSD, and uh, actually a few more that are supported also by our compiler. Uh, mobile, which means Android, iOS, and during this presentation I want to actually show you how the game running on Android, how it looks like to compile the game, to build the game on Android using our engine, and I will actually show it running uh, on the Android to you. And we also support Nintendo Switch, console Nintendo Switch. Uh, yeah, we uh, as a as a language that is being used to develop the engine and also your games, we use Modern Object Pascal. Now, is this kind of like raises some eyebrows? Well, I will address it later into the presentation. For now, basically, like uh, it's kind of a cool modern object-oriented language with generics, classes, interfaces, everything you would like to to have to develop a large application. So it's, uh, yeah, I will say more about it in, in, in during the presentation. We will actually go also in and modify some code. Okay. So uh, what about the version? Uh, in Debian right now contains the version 6.4, uh, sorry, which is our last stable release. But since two years now, we have been working on a new version of the engine. Uh, right now it's called 6.5, but it will become once released version 7.0, uh, which as you can see, well, it is a major release and we have added many new features to the engine since then. When in particular, we will have the editor, which I will show during this presentation extensively. We also support added excellent support for the GLTF format, which includes also support for the physical based rendering. Physical based rendering is also available in XVD version 4 using our engine. We also added the support for Nintendo Switch. We also added Gamma correction and about a hundred I guess refactors and API improvements and yeah so many many new features many new graphic features are going to appear in the new version of the engine so I'm going to be show so I'm going to show you a new version of the engine not yet packaged in Debian we are working on making it released well I guess as soon as possible and um, when it will be released I'm pretty sure that it will also be packaged in Debian soon okay so going forward, well, as I told, uh, the engine is using Pascal as a programming language, and for this reason, we use a free Pascal compiler, an open source Pascal compiler. Um, yeah, it's packaged in Debian, and you can use the FPC version that is packaged in Debian. You can also download the free Pascal upstream latest version yourself. Um, various FPC versions work with our engine. Uh, we also advise using Lazarus, which is kind of an IDE, Integrated Development Environment, uh, for uh, Pascal, and in particular integrated with the Free Pascal compiler. Uh, you can use it, it's an IDE, it's an editor, it's a debugger, uh, but basically you don't have to. I mean, you can actually just write Pascal code in any text editor you like. I use Emacs most of the time. <laughs> so yeah, most of the engine was developed using Emacs, <laughs> just like that. Um, Okay, so those are the dependencies. Okay, and that is actually everything that I wanted to say uh, as far as the introduction is concerned to the engine. And let's now jump to the actual live demo of how to use the engine and how to make cool stuff using the engine. So, once you download the engine, you go to our web page. You choose Linux, of course. And this results in a zip file that simply contains the engine source code and also the pre-compiled version of the engine editor and of the engine build tool and some other tools that are less important. And so right now I have already the engine installed on my system, so I will just run it and you will be able to see the editor. Okay. So once you have the editor running, well, the, things think, the first thing you actually want to do is actually you want to look in the preferences and you want to see what version of the Free Pascal compiler is detected. It should automatically detect whatever you have installed system-wide. But as I said, well, you can also choose your own version of the Free Pascal compiler if you'd like to. 
And yeah, so this is something that you have to make sure that is correctly set if you want to build games using the engine. But once you have it, well, you start developing. So we go and create a new project. Now let me start by creating a new project that is a very, very simple uh, three-dimensional first-person shooter game. So I will choose some name from my project. I will do create project. And yeah, and this is the editor. So this is how it starts. At the bottom you can see the list of your files, the list of your assets, if you'd like to call it in that way. <laughs> uh, data in particular contains all the data, all the data files that you will be able to load at runtime and to, to, to use, to, sh to show the user. And well, in particular, data contains something like custom user interface designs. And you can open any of them in this particular template it creates for you. Two, uh, two, two user interface designs already, uh, the main menu and the play, which is like the actual uh, game state. So I will just open the actual game state. And it looks like this. So on the left, you have a hierarchy of your objects, which includes the user interface items. Oh, sorry. Which includes the user interface items. And you can choose any one of them. You can choose a few of them at once if you'd like to. And on the right side, you have all the properties of the currently selected object. And in particular, we have some basic uh, properties, layout, everything else, events, and also all, which is like a, uh, basically a, a tab. If you know everything about the engine, then you can use the all tab and it contains everything uh, you'd like to configure about this particular object. Um, okay, so as you can see, on the scene, I have a few things. The most important thing actually is the full screen viewport which, well, as I said, it fills the full screen, I mean the full game window. Uh, just to show you that it's possible, uh, of course, it doesn't have to be the full screen. Like You can immediately make it and you can drag it around. So this is just a viewport. It's a two-dimensional control that you can move and drag around just by default. It's something full screen, okay? Uh, inside the viewport, you have, well, you have two things that, uh, that are important. One is the navigation method currently used inside the viewport. Uh, you can switch between various navigation methods using the menu, like the hamburger menu, near the viewpoint, near the viewport, sorry. So you can choose the examine, fly, walk, and uh, some other navigation methods. You don't have to use any of them, actually. In a, in, in a, in a, in a particular game, you can develop your own navigation method. Uh, there's not, not much to it. You just handle the keys, you just handle the mouse, touch input, whatever joystick, whatever you like, and you move the camera around in any way you desire. So those are just the like navigation methods that are like pre-configured for you, ready for you, but you don't have to use them. You can roll your own or you can customize the existing ones. Okay. And of course, since this is a component, I have selected it so I can also configure some properties of it already on the right side. For example, there's the move speed, like I can make it uh, 10 times faster. Like initially it's actually 10, so I can make it 100 and then it's 10 times more than the average actually in this case. Uh, okay, so this is one thing, like your navigation method inside the viewport. And well, the rest is items, which is like um, three-dimensional, in this case, three-dimensional models that you put in your game. And you can, of course, modify them and play around with them. But the most important property of a three-dimensional model is the URL, which basically says, well, what model to load. In this case, it's coming from a GLTF model of a level dungeon. This is the scene level. And for soldiers, for enemies kind of inside the game, well, there's another GLTF model that is being used to display them, okay? Uh, I will show you how to add them very soon, just feels like a quick overview of what's happening here, okay? So you have three-dimensional items here. In a two-dimensional game, you would also have two-dimensional items here, and actually you can mix a 3D and two-dimensional games here because uh, at the low level, well, there's no difference. There's just a different camera used for two-dimensional games conventionally, but that's it. I mean, you can mix and match uh, 2D and 3D games as you'd like to. So this is the viewport. Well, aside from the viewport, there are also, well, other user interface elements. And those are just simple labels that you can customize. Well, it's just a label. It's a text. You can customize it in any way you'd like. For example, I can write here something. Uh, well, random as you saw i can customize the color just to show you that it works uh, i can maybe change the font size okay so uh, nothing fancy here but basically we have a full library of user interface controls available inside the engine we have buttons images uh, groups for laying out controls you have uh, scroll views for 
putting out something that has a, a scroll bar on, on, on the side. So we have quite a full set of user interface controls that you can use. So as I said well, at the beginning, well, those user controls, they are not well, terribly, ter terribly interesting, right? So I'm just going to hide this label right now. Um, I will keep this label existing, this frames per second label. It will be actually filled at runtime with code, with the, well, actual value of frames per second, which means how fast your game is. So this one will be actually useful for us when we run the demo. Uh, yeah, so the viewport is also another user interface controls and as I kind of emphasized, well, you can move and customize around uh, things there. Uh, so let me actually do it. So you have, uh, you can select things, you can move things, rotate things, scale things inside the, of the viewport. So let me just select a soldier and basically move it around a little bit. Let me also take this one. Let me move him like this and let me actually, you know, move the camera. Once you use this button, use components as a normal user, well, it means what it says. It means that now I can use the game and I can walk around the game uh, using the navigation that I have chosen, which is right now the walk navigation with 10 times faster than default <laughs> speed. So I can move around my scene and I can look around uh, well, and inspect everything whether it's for debug purposes or whether I just want to see how the user sees it. Well, it's all the same, right? Um, okay, so what can we do more? Well, we can delete stuff, that's obvious, and we can also add stuff. So let me actually add something here. First, I will just add an empty scene. Let me make it inside the items. You can actually, of course, con construct here a transform hierarchy when one item is a parent of another, of another, of another, and well, it's a transformation hierarchy, so so transforming a group transforms everything inside. So well, uh, right now I just added a simple scene and place it at the top level to basically not mess around more than I need to. And let me just choose one uh, 3D model. I'm going to choose the soldier again, but in like five minutes I'm going to show you actually how to create your own models in Blender, just to show you that it works like from scratch, you can create things as you'd like here. So here I just added another soldier. Uh, he landed there, usually initially at the zero zero position. So yeah, so that's how you add things to the engine. Now, if you want to, by default, the soldier, as you can see, is in like a T pose because, well, his animation was not initialized yet. Uh, you can initialize the animation from code. This code is actually, this sample is actually doing that. Well, but I have not yet run the code. Right now I'm only in the editor mode. But also, if you'd like to, you can actually experiment with animations already in the editor by switching the auto animation property. And so I can choose the stand animation, which is kind of a boring, it's actually a still frame, and I can choose the walk animation, okay? And still I can experiment, move things around and see, well, how they look like, okay? So sometimes it's useful just for experimenting, and sometimes actually it's useful to just, you just want to set the animation at the design time because this is the animation that is going to be played when user opens this model, okay? Uh, now, one final note before uh, we go further is that well, everything you see here, well, those are not just some uh, stuff inside the engines, uh, uh, stuff inside the engine. This is actually uh, all those things that you see here, like the castle scene, the castle root transform, the castle viewport. All of those things are actual classes in Pascal that you can create using code. So, and this is a very important property of, of our engine. Well, everything you see, everything you design in, in the engine, it has one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence to what you actually do when using the code at runtime. All those things are just Pascal classes. And all the properties that you adjust here, like the URL, like the exists, like it means uh, literally whether something is existing or not, whether it's visible and colliding or not. So all of those things are possible. You can access them from the free pa uh, from the Pascal code. You can access them by name. Here it comes the scene one. Maybe let me make something like scene uh, better name because I ran out of ideas. So basically now you, I would be able to access the scene using the scene better name in Pascal code. Yes, I will show example of it later. But the point here is that you can access the scene from the Pascal code, change its properties. Uh, and also, of course, you can add and create and new scenes inside your Pascal code. So you are not uh, like uh, limited to using the editor. 
actually you can make a fully functional games we have done it <laughs> in the past using without the editor at all because everything that i talk about it's uh, it's possible to, to also achieve using the pure pascal code without any visual editing um which means that you have well the power of both both worlds you can design things visually you can then tweak them from code and you can add stuff from code and it's all like mix it in any way you'd like in any way that matches for your particular game and yeah and those things as i, as I started saying those things on the right where they are properties uh, properties is a pascal concept it's also present in c sharp uh, property is basically it looks like a field but actually it's something uh, that can be backed by a getter and setter function okay so it's, it's a concept that also is present in c sharp and it's a uh, well, on a language level, yeah, on, on, on a conceptual level, it's something present in every possible language, I guess. Um, okay, so this was a quick demo of adding some scene that was already existing in the project. Uh, before we move on, let's actually compile this project just to make see that it works. And then I will add some more tweaks to this demo, all right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to save this design, okay? This simply saves the file state underscore play dot custom user interface. And this file will be read at runtime by the, by the application. Okay, so how am I compiling the application? Well, I'm just going to do run, compile, and run. And that's it. Uh, I mean, that's how, how the building using the engine looks like. And underneath, it's actually calling the build tool, our custom game engine build tool, which is a simple command line application that can be used to build your application. Uh, underneath the build tool, well, it calls a uh, free Pascal compiler, of course. So actually, all the heavy work is done by the free Pascal compiler. Well, none of what I'm none of what what I'm describing would be possible without the free Pascal compiler. So 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 the build tool is just a wrapper here around the free Pascal compiler, calling it, uh, waiting for the compilation to happen. And once it does, it will run the application um, just as you would expect. Okay. And this is just a way to compile the application without even leaving the editor, uh, the custom game engine editor. So I didn't yet run even any text editor or debugger, but I will do it soon. So just now, write a demo, right now, only simply a demo that you can actually just visually design something and, uh, and yeah, you don't actually need to, to go and edit code before the basic template works. Okay. So this is the beginning of the game. This actually shows you the state main menu that you have not touched here. So it just has a very simple code that says that when you press the play button, well, it should go to the state play. And the state play is whatever you have designed. So it looks like this. And here you can see uh, the soldiers with those crazy tweaks that we have uh, made uh, to them in code. The soldiers have in this template already a built-in logic to move around in this, well, not very intelligent way, but it's just a, a sample, something starting point for your own artificial intelligence. And in particular, this one guy, this one guy that is in the back, well, this is the guy that we have added using the editor. I didn't yet plug here the artificial intelligence, plug him the artificial intelligence code, and that's why he's standing uh, in place. And also not even being affected by gravity. Of course, in the engine, we have uh, integration with the physics engine, Craft. You have also our own simple physics, which allows you to turn on gravity very easily. OK, so this is like very simple demo working. Oh, and the frames per second, as I kind of advertised, are also being updated. Uh, they are slow because I, I think the camera is just recording. It's uh, 60 frames per second. No worries in an actual environment. Okay, uh, so this was just a quick demo of a uh, running application on your Linux. Okay, so what can I do more? Well, let's try and actually do something in Blender and put it inside the game, all right? Just to, just to show that it's possible. So let me just run Blender. Okay. So once inside Blender, well, let's try to create a very simple level. Okay, so I'm going to delete the default cube and also the default camera. We are we not don't need it, although we could use this camera as an initial uh, starting point in the game. But in this case, we don't really need it. So I'm going to create a grid. Let me make it a bit more subdivided. Uh, let me also scale it up. Let's go into the selecting vertexes mode. Deselect everything. Let's select some walls around. 
and they are not yet walls but we are going to make them into walls mm, let's also select something in between just because we can i guess let's extrude them up um this is i guess good enough for the initial level let's delete here something to create like a, i guess the simplest possible way to create doors okay let's now create some columns i guess because why not again simply extruding them up that's enough okay let's also well we have one lighting source here already this blender light source will uh we're going to be is going to be exported to the gltf and is going to be used by the castle game engine so let's take one let's duplicate it a few times i guess all right and uh, maybe here and maybe here okay four light sources that should be enough okay now the point that i'm trying to make here with the quick blender demo is well not my mad blender skills but simply simply that it is really easy to make a model in blender and it's really easy to export it in a way that castle game engine can consume because okay what i'm going to do now is i'm going to simply export it to gltf and load it into the engine and really that's all there is to it so let me save it somewhere let's call it level two all right let's export it to gltf now the default gltf export settings are actually okay they, they work but usually it's more comfortable to select gltf separate options it's better to do that kind of diagnose stuff it's also usually nice to select apply modifiers if you have used any modifiers i didn't but just in case but well, i guess it's a force of habit right now i kind of remember to always select apply modifiers and actually that's it oh almost because now if i want to also export my light sources to the gltf well i have to select the checkbox okay so that's it we have created a level in blender i can actually close the blender now and let's go back to the editor so if i refresh this directory okay i have new subdirectory new level that i have just created the editor simply shows the normal uh, file hierarchy inside the project and here i have my blender model which is not going to be read by the engine directly instead the engine is going to read the gltf file now if you want to preview the gltf file or any other asset before putting it in the scene well one way is to well as you can see i just click on it and in the bottom right corner i can see kind of a preview inside our engine and it's a bit interactive actually i can move things around here uh, another thing is to double click on it and if I double click on it, then I run our view 3D scene, which is our full featured 3D and some 2D model viewer too. And well, in this case, there's still not <laughs> I can really do with this simple model, but in general, it allows you to have, well, it allows you to play around with this model, to have a lot of like options to, call, to, to test how it looks like in various conditions. You can play animations here. You can even play around with light sources here. You can move them here. So, so it's a full featured model viewer and a, a very, very, very small editor for models actually too. So right now I just checked it. It's oh, okay. It looks correct, right? So let me put it in game. So let's add another scene. Uh, let's also delete this uh, steel level the default one because well i guess otherwise they would well, try to compete <laughs> both of them trying to display the level uh, now let's try to load the new level i'm just pointing the engine to the gltf file in the using the url field and uh, that was my cat's uh, tail sorry <laughs> so uh, i'm just pointing the engine to my level file and really that's it i have loaded the level and it's automatically it works uh, without collisions yet i mean everything by default collides as a simple bounding box so for a level that's not really what you want you want the level to collide well precisely using the triangles so what you can select here is select dynamic collisions and rendering those two options make the uh, well in the simple case the rendering isn't really much needed but in general rendering means that the rubber is rendered using the efficient version of the fruston cooling and dynamic collisions well it means that the level collides as a set of triangles as opposed to a well, crude bounding box so that's it the level should already well basically be be, be functional we can i will run the game in like one second uh, just one more note is that if you want the level lighting to affect also the soldiers then you have to do one other thing which means that you need to set the scene one in this case which is our new level as the main scene okay 
So as you saw, when I did it, the the soldiers got lit, got lit by additional lighting that we have defined in Blender and that is now defined in the GLTF file. And uh, that's it. Let's run it. Let's save this design and let's run it. All right. Yeah. Uh, the first compilation of the project, by the way, uh, it compiles uh, not only your game, but it compiles also uh, the uh, it compiles also the engine, this, uh, which means that you can actually have uh, well, this is this was the basically the simpler approach to do, and it also means that you can experiment with the engine freely within your project. But basically, as you, uh, my point here was that if you compile the game again, of course, it doesn't recompile the engine again, so it is much faster. Okay, so the game is running. Let's play it. And that's it. It works. I can move around with my still uh, too fast camera because that's how I started this presentation. And everything works. Okay. So this was a very, very simple demo that you can basically design your models in Blender. You can put it in the engine and well, it, it works. Okay. Uh, what more did I want to present? So I wanted to add some button and I wanted to co control what happens when you press this button from code, which means that I also wanted to show you the source code of the project that we're making. So let's do it. Let's create a new button. This is very simple. I'm just using the add new button. Now the things look small here, but remember that we, by default, the engine uses user interface scaling, which means that the things, well, they are small when they are displayed on a small screen, which the editor is right now simulating. But when the game window will be larger, when then everything, every user interface part will be larger too. This is fully configurable uh, inside uh, the project settings. Okay. So what I want to do right now is I want to anchor this button to the right side of the screen because, as you can see, anchoring it to the left, si right, left side of the screen isn't really uh, isn't really working for me. So I'm going to do this, I'm going to move it, and I'm going to do it like this. Now the button is anchored to the right side of the screen. Nice. Uh, I'm going to call it uh, like show message. And I'm going to call this button button show message. This is how I'm going to access this button uh, from my code. I can make the font also, I guess, a little bit larger. By default, the button size is adjust itself, adjust itself to the button caption, but of course this is configurable, as well as the look of the button. Like It's just a default look of the button. You can, of course, configure it, it using images, uh, using, uh, using colors. So button is really something that is clickable. Like how it looks, it's completely configurable using a lot of options that you can see here. So. Like, don't worry about this default look of the button. You can customize it in, in many ways you like. Okay, so we've done it. We made the button. When I run the game, it will already show the button. There's really nothing fancy about this particular part of the demo. It's just a non-working button in this case. All right, let's hit play. And there's the button. I can click it. Nothing happens yet. Okay. Yeah. So how to make something happen? Well, to make something happen, I want to open the uh, source code, which is in Pascal, as I kind of mentioned a few times. Now, if you worry about Pascal being like an old language and so on, well, basically it's not. I mean, we're using the modern object Pascal as implemented by Free Pascal Compiler. Uh, as I think mentioned, uh, it supports generics, classes, and well, a lot of other stuff. And let's actually see how it looks like. Uh, inside. So what I did right now is I double clicked on the game state play uh, source code, which uh, contains the initial code of your play state, which is which corresponds by default. It's actually very flexible, but by default it corresponds to what you have designed in the state play dot user interface. Okay. And what I can do right here, well, I can for example access some components using their names. Okay. So what did I call it? Button show message, right? So let me just go and copy paste it just to be sure that I won't make any typo. Okay, so we have button show message. Now for now, I like have to do it manually, this accessing of the components. We have a plan to, of course, make it automatic. But as you can see, well, it took me, I don't, I didn't count, but not much time to do it. So once I have accessed the button show message from code, well, I can do anything I'd like to. For example, I can configure its caption. 
But well, we already actually set the caption that makes sense, I guess. But ah, just to show you. So message new caption, all right? And well, what is actually more more useful for us here is that I can say what happens if you click the button. Here I just assign, assign an event to it, which is just simply a callback. Uh, what happens when you click on the button? Mm. And I found that a useful convention call those thing click something something. Now I'm going to press in Lazarus control shift C, which means that Lazarus will do code completion, which means that it will actually automatically figure out that hey, what you wanted is you wanted to create a method called click show message. It plays the declaration of this method in the source code. And now what I have to do is simply fill it. So I'm going to use something that is, well, it's really mostly for the debugging, I guess, purposes, is that I'm going to simply use a message OK uh, procedure that displays a very, very simple uh, dialog box. So here it goes. OK, I also want to add this. Uh, definition of application and definition of message OK. Uh, do you need to define those things? I want to add them, make them available to make this thing compile. And that's it. Uh, how to compile it now? Well, I can go back to the editor. I can do run compile. It's, and it's, it's the same thing as if press as pressing run and compile from the Lazarus. It's just the same source code using the service units, the same units. Um, well, let me do it from the editor right now, but it really doesn't matter. You can run your project on desktops from Lazarus. Uh, it works the same way, it compiles the same thing. So you can, and you can, of course, use debugger using Lazarus. So if you develop using Lazarus, it's, well, usually it's better actually to, to run the project from Lazarus. Okay, so here it is, play. Show message new caption. Yeah, you clicked. I warned you that this is going to be like a very. Well, it's not really a production. Well, it's a. It's an ugly dialog box. Okay, let's say it explicitly. But well, it's a simple way to set, to show of showing that something works. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this was a very simple demo that you can modify the three D template created by the editor, and you can edit code there. You can add the resources from Blender easily. Uh, you can modify the user interface and yeah, you can control what happens when you, for example, click on a button. Mm, yeah. So this is about the three-dimensional demo of our engine. Now, the next slide, demo in two dimensions. This is going to be a little bit quicker because I'm not going to pick it so much around as I did with the three-dimensional demo. So let's go back. Let's close this project and let's create a new one, starting from the two-dimensional demo, demo template. Of course, if you worried about those templates like doing too much for you, remember that there's also the, always the empty template. Uh, so I guess you can treat those kind of two and three, 2D and two, uh, 3D uh, templates as well, kind of a nice starting point, I guess, for some games. But uh, once you learn the engine, I guess it's probably easiest to just start from the empty template. Still, they are very useful for, as you can see, demonstrations. So here I'm going to use the two-dimensional game. Okay. And again, it's like in the data file, I can find uh, state play, which shows how the game will look like once played. Now, again, this is a viewport. It contains custom scenes. So the same thing as you saw in 3D, it's simply by default right now, it has a two dimensional uh, a camera that has orthographic projection. So it's something more useful for the traditional two dimensional games. You can always like switch between two-dimensional orthographic camera and perspective camera at runtime. This is all configurable using the camera properties of the viewport. You can say what is the projection type. You can configure all those projection parameters uh, inside the orthographic or perspective subcomponents. Okay, so 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 as I emphasize, like two D is and three D, they are just playing very well together. It's just a matter of what is your default camera view. Uh, okay, what happens here? Well, the same thing as we did before. So you can, for example, move things around. Right? Let me move this dragon around. Now it works. Uh, what can I do with it? Well, I can compile it for desktop. It will work. It's something that you've already seen. So let's actually go uh, to something else. Let's do something else, which means that let us uh, make it running on Android. Okay. Now, how to do it? Well, uh, one way to do it is to, well, you, you will need to, one way to, well, basically to compile something for Android, you need Android SDK and DK and uh, free Pascal compiler with cross compilation option to Android. 
Now, one way to do it is basically a manual. It's explained in the uh, engine, engine documentation, of course, how to install all this necessary stuff yourself. But there's another way, and I'm going to show it to you right now, which is to use our Docker image, which is a, a ready-to-use Docker image that contains a free Pascal compiler with various cross-compilers installed. It also contains Castle Game Engine with its build tool, command line build tool. And it also contains Android uh, SDK and NDK uh, tools to create easily create Android APK. Uh, yeah, so let's try to do it. So this is documented in the Custer Game Engine documentation. Here I'm just going to copy paste the basic line how to use the Docker from Custer Game Engine. So because this Docker line is mounting my home directory inside the Docker image, so I can simply access my project by going here. All right, this is my project. Now I want to build it, okay? To build it for Linux, I would do this, okay? Compile, by default, simply compiles for the current uh, operating system, which means uh, Linux right now. Uh, but actually, but if I would like to, now what I want to do more is I want to package it, which means to create something distributable. And I also said that I want to create this package for Android, okay? And that's it. Now we simply wait. Uh, the build tool, as I emphasized, it simply uses the free Pascal compiler under the hood. None of what I'm talking about would be possible without free Pascal compiler. Um, yeah, it's uh, co using the free Pascal compiler right now two times to compile the engine for two architectures, which is 32-bit uh, ARM and 64-bit ARM, which means both uh, CPU processor architectures that are used by the Android devices. Okay. And uh, this command, once it finishes, it will just create a ready APK that you can transfer to your device in any way you'd like and run it there. And I'm going to show you how this APK works on the actual Android device. Uh, for this, I'm going to actually like uh, use the fact that this is the pre-recorded session. So <laughs> I'm going to basically, uh, right at this point where I'm speaking, I'm going to paste uh, a bit of uh, another video that I will record on my Android device and uh, showing you that it works. Okay, so right now, yeah. Okay, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I think this is all that I wanted to show you in this presentation about Castle Game Engine. Uh, I know that I started to speak very, very fast at some point, right? I started fast and then I went even faster, I think, along the way. So sorry about that. I hope it was comprehensible, basically. I hope it was understandable what I was saying. Uh, if you have any questions about the engine, uh, please go ahead and ask them. We have a forum, Discord chat. Uh, I have a mail. I'm available like for all the questions. I'm curious about your questions and well, yeah. <laughs> uh, please feel welcome to use the engine. Here's the link. And it's all open source. Please try it out yourself. And uh, yeah, and watch out for the 7.0 release that we are going to make. I hope really, really soon because we have been working on it for quite some time. Thank you. Thank you very much.